thing. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. He is everything to us. Praise God. Father, we thank you for being everything. Hallelujah, Lord, for healing our sicknesses and diseases. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, for making us whole, for making us one with you. Thank you, Father. We bless you today and praise you for your mighty acts and your excellent greatness. You are mighty God. Hallelujah. Our Heavenly Father, our Abba. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Praise God. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Great job, as always. I'm always amazed. Praise the Lord. Great job and appreciate it so much. Everybody's sharing your testimonies and prayer requests. It's a, such a blessing. Praise the Lord. And uh, thank Mike and Suzanne, again, as always, they are doing so much, so many things that uh, everybody isn't seeing. But uh, thank you for all that you're doing, your hard work and efforts. Praise the Lord. And all of you for being here and, and sharing your love for the Lord with each other and with us. And everybody out there on Facebook online you're part of this as well amen we appreciate the distance means nothing to god so amen we know that uh, you're with us in spirit and so we are all one in him praise god so god bless all of you out there and have a great one uh, be blessed in jesus name amen, amen. sally and i uh, celebrated our 40th anniversary who would have thunk it <laughs> nobody 40 years ago i promise you not even me probably but uh, in fact there's been a few times in between that 40 that i was a question in Praise God. But uh, so my daughter had posted something on Facebook about it, and it was really sweet of her and nice that she had. And one of the things she said, though, was that we, had, we don't always agree on everything. I think that was an understatement. But uh, I've always said, and I told Sally this long ago, if we agree on everything, one of us is redundant. <laughs> well, one of us is unnecessary, in other words. Praise the Lord. So amen. Thank the Lord for 40 years with this good woman here. Praise the Lord. Uh, I mean that, praise God. He's been good to us. <clears throat> in spite of us. Amen. Amen. So, praise God. Great to be in the house of the Lord as always. And, uh, uh, you know, weird times, turbulent times. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. I reckon this is pretty close to that, one of those things. Amen. But, uh, that being said, how do you uh, get a country girl's attention? A tractor. You know what kind of a drink can be bitter and sweet? Reality. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm going through these fast because it's, I know it's painful and I just, I'd rather, you know, I, when it's me personally, I'd rather have the pain be sharp and over with and just drawn out. And, so, Why oysters don't give to charities? This is obvious. They're shellfish. <laughs> well, staying with the animal theme, how does a penguin build its house? It glues it. <laughs> and I was sharing this with Mike and Suzanne and whoever was here early this morning. Uh, and I thought about this over the years too. You know, the number one cause of divorce is marriage. <laughs> Can't have one without the other, praise the Lord. Anyway, God is good. Praise the Lord. Appreciate you all being here again. And uh, let's uh, go to the Word of God. Amen. I want to start this morning with uh, Ephesians, Peter, chapter 6, and um, verses 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Praise God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Praise the Lord. Now, at verse 12, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. In other words, invisible things in this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's uh, go to 2 Corinthians, Peter, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Now verse 12 there is actually a metaphor that we, are, we have to be conscious, in other words, of these realities. We have to make them real to us, not just vague kind of principalities, powers. No, this has to be real in our minds. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or not physical, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Well, the Lord was speaking to me this week about this very thing because like, we all, there's moments where you ha have this anxiety. You know, you think, what the heck is going on here, you know, and, and why this building on top of things, you know. But it's just the devil. It's the way the devil always works. He never just throws one thing at you. He tries to dump everything on you at once. And that's what we're going through, amen. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's not just the coronavirus. It's not just the, the racial uh, race issues and, and violence and all that's springing up from that. But it's a multitude of personal things that are going on in everybody's life, too, on top of all of these bigger th issues, right? And so we're struggling with this. And before Paul gets into the, the idea of this uh, uh, spiritual armor, which is spiritual armor, by the way, I mean, he's telling us the loins, gir the girdle around the loins, he's, that's a metaphor. That's a, a type, right? The reality is truth. So this isn't something we're putting on. It's something we have to believe. That's how we put it on. We receive it by believing it. Amen. And so it's the same way with the breastplate. What's the breastplate? It's your righteousness in God. Amen. Or your right, the righteousness of God in you because of Jesus. Amen. And so the, the feet shod with the gospel over throughout the Bible talks about the gospel of grace is what Jesus was preaching everywhere that he went. Amen. And so it, it, what does that do? The gospel of peace, it brings peace. And it's peace between us and God. God is no longer an enemy. God is no longer a judge. He is our Father. Praise the Lord. And then the shield is faith. We have to take faith. You have to use faith. You can't just have it sitting in the corner somewhere like a shield. You have to put it on. You have to believe in that reality. Amen. And then the helmet, which is your salvation. Amen. It protects everything. Praise God. And then there is probably, to me, the most important, if not... Uh, faith is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God we have to use these things we have to make them a reality in our lives not just some vague you know kind of uh, implications uh, in, in the scripture he's telling us Paul is telling us but before he gets to this armor before he gets to the place where he's saying now that you need to you need to be operating in the truth you need to realize you are the righteousness of God in Christ you need to understand that grace has set you free amen you have been given freedom amen because of this you need to realize Faith is a powerful force. It's a powerful spiritual force. Amen. And you need to realize you are saved. You're not getting saved. You're not working towards salvation. You are saved. Amen. And then you need to realize to stay saved, you're going to have to use that sword. You're going to have to defend yourself. And the way you do that is with the word of God. Amen. So before Paul begins this message on our spiritual armor, he tells us to receive supernatural power. Amen. Go back to Ephesians 6.10 and just leave that up there for a little bit so we can kind of focus on that. Finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. He's getting us ready, amen, for this armor, how we use, use the armor, right? So before he begins that message on the armor, he says, receive this supernatural power. Now, here's the deal. We have received it, but we don't always realize that it's available, that we have it, and that we should be using it. So what he's saying, when he's saying receive this, he's telling you, wake up. 
to the reality of what you have. This power, amen? This supernatural power of His might, amen? Be strong because of this power, right? So finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. So what does that actually mean? I mean, what exactly does being strong in the Lord mean? Well, the word strong, and I did a word search this week because that's what I was trying to figure out. But the word strong comes from a uh, compound Greek, two, two words that are compound word in the, the Greek, which is endunamu. Endunamu. Okay? Now, what that means is, it's, it's, as I said, it's two words that are joined together, and it's en, which is en in the Greek, which means en, and then dunamis, which means explosive strength or ability or power. So when these two words are compounded together, the new word in dunamu describes an empowering or a inner strengthening, the idea of being infused with an excessive dose of dynamic inner strength and ability. Paul says you need to wake up to what you've got, to what that Holy Ghost is. It's more than just, you know, leading and guiding. It's strengthening. It's giving power. It's giving authority. It's giving you the force of God to operate in your life. It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that's in us. It's Christ in us. Amen. The hope of glory. So the idea is the idea of being infused with this excessive dose of dynamic inner strength and ability. We need to be focusing on these things and not on all the external things and realize the only way we're going to change anything outside of us is by being changed inside. By recognizing who we are and what we are in Christ and what our capabilities are through the blood-bought uh, life that Jesus Christ has given us. Yes. Amen? So it's power that's being deposited into something, a container, a vessel or some other form of receptacle. Well, we know by the scriptures that we are the receptacles into which this power is being put, or has been put, or deposited. Amen? So Paul knows we need to receive this power before our fight with these unseen forces. In other words, we need to be operating by the Spirit before we go into battle, amen, with spiritual forces. And don't kid yourself, these are spiritual forces that are at work here. This isn't just human beings, amen, it's a spiritual force that's trying to move things in a certain direction, um, amen, so that, he can, so that the enemy can create chaos and confusion, and that's all he does. That's what he always does. I'm not saying there aren't people that have legitimate rights. I'm just saying the way it's being distorted, amen, into violence and so forth, is an act of the enemy. So finally, brethren, he says, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. It's a position that we have. He's telling you how we can be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Not in your anger, not in your frustration, but in the Lord be strong. Put your confidence in what God has done for us, what He is doing and what He wants to do for us, if we will believe, if we will recognize what we have in Christ. Amen? He has, see, we are perpetually, endlessly, infinitely locked up in the person of Jesus Christ. We are one with Him. Yes. He is in us. Yes. We are in Him. We are one. Yes. Praise the Lord. And so He has become our realm of existence. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Remember I talked about last week. He's our habitation. Yes. Psalms 91 says He is our refuge and our habitation. He's where we dwell. Yes. Amen. And it's where He dwells. Yes. We are one. Look at Acts chapter 17. Uh, verse 28, Peter. Paul understood this. He was dealing with, I mean, I, I was thinking, Don was talking about how he, he was led by the Holy Spirit. Remember the time he wanted to go into Macedonia, right? He, he felt like that's the place I should go because obviously these people need to know about Jesus. They need to be born again. They had not heard the gospel. But the Holy Spirit stopped him. The Holy Spirit, he said, the Holy Spirit would not let me go. Why? Because the time wasn't right. God had dealt with these people. People have to be drawn by the Spirit. It isn't just about us. We have to reach out to them because we don't know who He's dealing with and who He's not dealing with. Amen? But it's the Holy Spirit that draws people to the Lord. So for in Him, Paul said, we live and move. In Him we live. He's our habitation. In Him we live. In Him we move. We have action. We have life. Amen? And have our being, our true identity. Amen? As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Praise the Lord. Uh, let, in fact, let's back up to 26 and 27 there, just to kind of put this into context. 
and hath made of one blood. Now, this is exactly what we've been talking about. There's no black, there's no white, there's no gray, green, there's no yellow, there's no red. You know what I'm saying? Not in God's eyes. Exactly. He says, and hath made of one blood yes. all nations, or you could say ethnicities, or however you want to define that. But it's of men, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. We're not here by accident in 2020. This stuff is happening, and we're here for a reason. Exactly. Not for punishment, not for pain, but to make a difference. Yes. To have an impact, to change things, yes. that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. And on to 28 again, Peter. For in Him, that's, a, that's the context of what he's talking about, because in Him's where we live. In Him is how we move yes. or operate, amen, and have our being, yes. Yes. our existence. Amen. Praise the Lord. At this very moment, you are immersed. In God's supernatural power, whether you realize it, whether you operate in it or not, it's a reality for every born-again believer. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's yours for the taking. And how do you take it? By faith. The same way you take your healing, the same way you take your deliverance, the same way you take your prosperity, the same way you take everything that God has provided for us. Yes. You take it by faith. But in Ephesians 6.10, Paul gives us another important uh, evidence of the Spirit empowering work in our lives. How the Spirit empowers us to operate, amen, as Christ in the world. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So let me remind you, Ephesians 6.10 is a verse about supernatural power. Praise the Lord. Not human effort, not human strength, but supernatural power. Power that God has made available for our fight with unseen demonic powers that come to war against the soul or the mind, the will, and the emotions. Yes. That's what God gave us. He gave us the Holy Ghost for times just like this. Yes. We are here. We're like, we're, we're, we're like Esther. We were created for this kind of time. We have been given power to deal with the problems that are going on in the world right now. Whether it's epidemics, whether it's uh, hatred, whether it's uh, strife, whatever it might be. We have, given, we have been given power to deal with it, if we'll deal with it by the Spirit. Exactly. Not by the flesh, not by just anger and frustration and payback. Praise the Lord. Amen. Power, that word power, is a Greek word, kratos. K-R-A-T-O-S. And it means demonstrated power. So he's given us power. It's not just power. It's not just inert. It's, it's demonstrated power. Or in other words, power that's demonstrative. Power that is erupting. Power that is tangible. Power that's real. And I'm feeling it right now. I'm telling you. God has given us something so powerful that if we would tap into it once and for all, realize who we are and what we are and what God has made available to us, this world would change. It would be turned over again just like it was in the first century. That they had a revelation of this. They didn't just read it out of a book. They felt it. They lived it. They were experiencing it. And believe me, they had tough times. Yes. Yes. They had a whole government trying to destroy them. Killing them, murdering them. Religious uh, leaders having them put to death. It was a mess. We're not the first ones to go through a bunch of crap in this world. That's right. But we have God on our side. Yes. We have God on our inside. Hallelujah. Praise God. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, Peter. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. This stuff is demonstrative. It's eruptive. It's tangible. In other words, it's real. It's not fantasy. It's not some religious idea. It is a fact. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe? According to the working of His mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. I want to read this again. And what is the exceeding greatness? He's not asking the questions. He's telling us what just came before. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places? That's Kratos' power. 
In the English, it's, this is a little backwards, but in the English, the King James sentence structure is kind of backwards because it's not in total agreement with, with the original Greek. If you study any other language, I, I took a little Spanish in school, never was much good at it. I am able to order a beer occasionally. But other than that, cerveza por favor. Uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> praise the Lord, I'm not a bilingual. I'm barely unilingual. I'm just saying that the King James, it's like Spanish. So you, if you break a Spanish sentence down and, and make it into precise English, it does, the, the subjects are always in the wrong place. Everything's backwards. Everything looks, it only makes sense if it's in Spanish. When you translate it back to English, then it sounds kind of stupid. It doesn't make sense. And this, it's kind of the same way with the Greek language a lot of times. But the Greek says, according to the working of the power of his might. And that's important. The Greek says, according to the working of the power of his might. And the reason it's important is because the power of his might is an identical phrase that's used in Ephesians 6.10. You say, so what? So what? The power is resurrection power. You have resurrection power in you. That's why you're never going to die. But it's not just for when we physically die. Exactly. It's resurrection power or it's the greatest power that there is in the universe that you have in you. Yes. Yes. Praise God. The power that's working behind the scenes to energize us for combat with an unseen evil power. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Think of it. The kind of power that God used when he raised Jesus from the dead is the very same power, the exact power, the identical power that is now at work in us. Amen. Holy moly, how can we not be power? How can we not operate in the power of God knowing that we have this? problem is we don't really know it. Right. We've heard about it, but we don't exercise it. We don't move in it. Right. Right. Praise the Lord. We have resurrection power. Now think about that. All that God is, all the power that He possesses, all the energy, all the mighty ability energizes this Kratos power that is now at work in believers. Amen. And anybody who has been empowered by the Holy Spirit, anybody that's been born again, received the Holy Spirit, and the power is at work in you and me. Amen. Amen. We are equipped to kick some devil butt. Yes. We have been equipped to whip the daylights out of any foe that would dare assault us. Yes. And we're hiding when we're fearful. I guarantee you, if, you, if we stand up in the power and the authority that we have, the devil trembles. Yes. Just like he did when Jesus came. Yes. Amen? He, the devil believes. He trembles yes. because of what he believes. But he don't want you to believe because if you believe, you'll put him to flight. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hallelujah. Look, look, look at Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now we talked about the armor. We're not talking about physical stuff. We're talking about spiritual forces that we have been given. Spiritual power that we've been given that we need to put on. In other words, we need to recognize it. We need to receive it. We need to be aware of it. Conscious of it. Amen. So that ye may be able to stand against. Now here's what's cool. That word against is face to face. Amen. Eyeball to eyeball. I used to box some in the Marine Corps and uh, I wasn't a great fighter but I did do some boxing and I'll tell you there's nothing like looking somebody in the eyeball and knowing you're gonna have a battle. It's altogether different than just getting outraged or getting mad and doing something but look just looking somebody right face to face and you know somebody's gonna get whipped here because you can't both win. A draw is a loss. Amen? And so that's what this, that's the definition that he gives us. Against the wiles of the devil. In other words, he's saying, we're coming face to face with this guy. And you better not blink. You better not back up. You better not cower. You better not show fear. Or he's going to be on you like white on rice. Amen? And so we're, we are a terrible threat. Get this. If we understand who we are, if we have confidence in what we have available to us, we are a threat, a horrible threat to the devil. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, we, you know, we go around talking about what he's going to do to us. He's just hoping to God that we don't find out who we are because he is defeated. Yes. 
That's more than a defeat. It is a disaster for the devil. Yes. When Christians wake up to the power and the authority that they have in Christ. Yes. Amen. We are a threat to his dominion. We are so mighty and powerful in Jesus. The devil and his minions do not have a chance. No more than they had with Jesus. Amen. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now what, what are the wiles of the devil? I'm going to give you the translation here. Wiles was translated from the Greek. When it's translated, it literally is translated method. Or literally it means with a road. Now, when I read that, I thought, okay, now what the heck is this about? With a road. The wiles of the devil. So the devil operates with or on a road. And that means that the common or the usual uh, belief of most people that the devil is so full of tricks and he's so devious and so smart and so brilliant and so has so many plans of attack and so many ways of, of coming after you, amen, and so many deceptions. And he'd like us to believe that as well. But it's not true. The word wiles plainly means that the enemy travels on one road, one lane, one avenue. In other words, he primarily is a one-trick pony. Yes. He's actually just, he's got one trick in his bag. And obviously, he's learned to use that one trick pretty well. He's had a long time to be using it, to practice with it. Amen? So if the devil operates on one single avenue, this is what my question in my mind was, what's the destination of that road? Where is that road leading to? Where is that taking him? That demonic road is headed towards something. And what is it? And that leads us to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his, Satan's, devices. The Greek word for that is nous, N-O-U-S, and it means mind or intellect. So the idea is of a deceived mind, or Satan comes to fill the human mind with confusion. That's the road he's on. That's the road, that's where the road leads him. That's where he's always headed. That's where he's always after. That's what he always does, the same one trick. Paul uses the word devices because he knew from experience about the mind games that the devil tries to pull on people. Wow. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. And all of us know this. I mean, we've lived... How many... You ever wake up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you're just confounded with fear and you don't even know why or, or what it might be or you start thinking about grandkids or you start thinking about your kids or you start thinking about something else you know I woke up in the middle of the night thinking the air conditioner was going to break well it did but it was here not in my house praise the Lord because I never heard it kick on you know <laughs> seriously and then so all, I'm just saying I got up at five o'clock this morning and went upstairs I couldn't go back to sleep now I wasn't fear you know fear like trembling or anything but I was just uncomfortable and I just started talking to the Lord, and I said, Lord, you promised to give me sleep, peace, and sleep. You know what? I fell asleep in this big old chair upstairs, and the footstool. I turned the footstool this way so it was longest, so I could lay with most of me on the thing. Without, you know, my legs are hanging over the end of it, but otherwise, it wasn't bad. And I went to sleep. Why? Because I just started saying what God promised. I just started believing what God said. Instead of thinking about all the anxious thoughts that could come to you when your mind is at peace, when your mind is at sleep or at ease, you have no defense. It just comes, you know, whether it's a dream, whatever it might be. So when I, when I woke up, I started to work against it, and it went away, and I went to sleep. So casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So every negative thought, every fearful thought has to be brought into obedience to the Word of God. In other words, it has to submit to Jesus. It has to bow its knee to Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. So Paul uses that word. We have to stop listening to ourselves and start talking to ourselves. Yeah. 
Amen. You ever, I mean, come on. I get weird thoughts every once in a while. And I have to say, where the hell did that come from? And that is where it came from. It came from hell. And then I have to start speaking to that thought, just like this morning. Quit listening and start talking. Amen. The road the devil is headed toward is the mind. Praise the Lord. Whatever controls a person's mind controls that person's health and it controls their emotions. That's why the enemy wants to penetrate a person's intellect. Your mental control center. So he can find it, or so that he can flood it, I should say, with deception and with lies and with fear and accusations. Then he can begin to manipulate a person's body and their emotions from a position of control. He can get them to do stuff that they wouldn't otherwise do. We're seeing a lot of stuff, people doing things that they would never do. Exactly. But they're doing it because of anger, because of fear, because of whatever it is, they're being manipulated. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. And that's true of everybody. We're all, we're all the same thing. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's where renewing your mind with the Word of God and allowing God's power to work within you is, some, is, is so important. Mm-hmm. If you don't take charge of your mind... And start speaking God's truth to yourself and combat the devil's lies, you are snared, the scripture says. You are trapped. Praise the Lord. And that means deception continues, and eventually that process will be complete and your fears will become reality. Praise the Lord. That's why God gave us His Word to stop that. So that we don't become captive, so that we don't go back into bondage to the enemy. Think, just think, for example, Job. What I feared the most has come upon me. He just dwelled on it. He was worried about it. He was confused. Instead of speaking to it, instead of declaring the goodness of God and so forth, now I realize he, he didn't have the information or the revelations that we have. But nevertheless, he knew there was a God. But he didn't utilize the power that was available to him. So let me just, let me just do it this way. One of the best uh, biblical examples of uh, demonic intimidation or the wiles and devices and deceptiveness of the devil is David and Goliath. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and we'll read verses 3 through 11. 1 Samuel 17 verses 3 through 11. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. There was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. I looked that up. That's nine foot nine. Praise God. Nine foot nine. That makes these seven foot basketball stars little guys. Nine foot nine. Praise the Lord. He had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. That's like 150 pounds or something. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies, Amen, of Israel, and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So get this. It really wasn't Goliath's size. It really wasn't his weapons that caused Israel to shrink back in fear. But it was the constant... This went on for days, if not weeks. It was the constant threats and mental bombardment that Goliath hit them with day after day after day. That mental harassment crippled the Hebrew soldiers so that they lost sight of the awesome ability of their God and all they could think about was, I'm going to die if I have to fight this guy. 
When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So Goliath mentally and emotionally immobilized the armies of Israel without ever using a sword or a spear, without ever using any physical weapons. But David, this little guy, this little red-headed guy, they call him Rudy, right? Sheila, you can relate. The Lord with my grandkids. <laughs> Amen. He had heaven's perspective. Wasn't he was, it wasn't that he was stronger. It wasn't that he was braver. It wasn't that he was bigger. He just had a different perspective. He knew that the outward man, the flesh, counted for nothing. When it comes to moving in the supernatural power of God, this flesh is nothing. Exactly. So let's look now to 1 Samuel 17, verse 45 through 51. 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 51. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. I'm just saying right now, you, the devil, you can come to us with this hatred and this anger and this frustration and all that's going on. You can come to us with disease and, and COVID-19 or whatever you want to, but we're coming to you in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And every knee's got to bow to Jesus Christ, to our Lord and our Savior. Hallelujah. He has become our habitation. Yes. It's where we live. Yes. It's where we move and have our being. Yes. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. That's, this is what we need to be confessing to all this craziness that's going on in the world right now. I will smite thee. I'll take your head from thee. And I'll give your carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Iowa, in the United States, in the earth. Praise the Lord. And all this assembly shall know. And all the world will know that the Lord saves not with a sword or a spear, not with flesh and blood, not with human strength, for the battle is the Lord's, amen, and He will give you into our hands. This battle is not ours. This battle is the Lord's. And if we try to fight it in any other way than it through Christ, we're going to become losers. Yes. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David that David hastened. He didn't back up. He went running towards him. When he saw that giant come at him, he went right after it. Amen. He hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone, stunk, or the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. With a little bit of nothing yeah. in the natural compared to all the weapons that Saul had. Physically, it looked insurmountable, looked impossible, but he had a heavenly perspective. He knew who was on his side, and all he needed was that one. And he slew him, and there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, praise the Lord, and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Praise God. How about you and me? Are we tired of being mentally harassed, emotionally tormented by the lying, insinuation, threats, and accusations of the adversary? Exactly. It's time to run at the enemy instead of running from him. Start taking our authority yes. instead of yielding it yes. or ceding it in every situation. We've got to move beyond the realm of our fleshly means of defense and enter into the realm of Holy Ghost power and the Word of God. The government it can't fix this stuff. If it could, it would have been fixed. It's just trying. It's, it's just, it's crapshoot. We are the ones that can change it. We're the only ones that can change it. And it has to be done in love. It has to be done in grace. Yes. We have to enter into the realm of the Holy Ghost, into the powerful realm of the Word of God. If the enemy finds you with your guard down, he'll try to pave a road into your mind so that he can confuse you and intimidate you with mind games, 
Because his goal is to deceive you to the point that you actually begin to believe his threats. If he succeeds, your false perceptions are going to be empowering his lies so that they become a reality in your life. Use God's word and power, and you'll have explosive, dynamic power to stand face to face with the devil and spit in his eye. He's in a, a defeated enemy. You have resurrection power because of your position in Christ. Yes. You have all the power of the universe. You yes. have resurrection power. You have God power. Yes. Yes. Revelation chapter 12, uh, 9 through 11. This will be the last scripture. Revelation 12, 9 through, uh, through 11. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. It doesn't sound right, does it? The devil's been cast down here, and yet he says, Now comes the salvation. Now comes the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. That's us, folks. Amen. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They were not afraid of the threats of death. They were not afraid of the enemy's threats. Right. Praise the Lord. They put their trust in God and his power and his love for them that would cast that devil out, that would destroy him and his minions. Praise the Lord. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord, your habitation, and in the power of his might. Stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against invisible enemies. Amen. Against powers, against rulers of darkness. Amen. In this world. Right. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Hallelujah. Can you say amen about the government? There could be some spiritual wickedness there in high places. Why? They're being manipulated. They're being hassled, controlled. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. It's time to just get tough. It's time to, you know, get up off the canvas, amen, and go another round. Because the thing isn't over until you give up or until somebody's hand gets raised. And God has already raised us up and made us set together with Him in heavenly places. It's time for us to operate from that position in Jesus' name. And I'm telling you, we can. We can because it's a reality. This power is real and it's in each and every one of us. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. God's going to be shown mighty in this earth. And the whole world. He said, when darkness covers... The light is going to shine brighter than it ever has before. The revelation of God has become, become greater and greater. When the, more, uh, the more the enemy comes against us, the more God lifts us up. The stronger we become, the more defeated he is. The more he realizes we're just reinforcing a defeat that took care, was taken care of 2,000 years ago. Actually, before the foundation of the world. We're just going to whip up on him. It's time to start throwing some body blows. Amen. It's time, it's time to start making him back up. Get him in a quarter, in a corner and beat him, amen, like a bad dog. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm not happy, but I am excited. Because I know that we're, we were born for just such a time. And I mean, it gives me goosebumps to think about God going to give us, give us the privilege of being the one to settle this thing once and for all. Yes. Praise the Lord. And the devil knows it, and he's scared crapless yes. that we will find out who we are and we'll begin to operate in that reality. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. He's shaking in his boots. Amen. That doesn't mean he won't come and try to plant lies and, and throw crap at us. But the more he does, the more we need to rise up and take the word of God and run him right out of the building, right out of the state, right out of the country, right out of this earth and into hell where he belongs. Yes. Give the Lord one more hand. Yes. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Let's go in the power of His might. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You are dismissed.